first of all, I am very grateful to Dr. Samin Sharma for inviting me to this important seminar or symposium. I'm going to be talking about cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease on new bases of imaging for prediction and prevention. And there are three stages in life that are quite different when we talk about prediction and prevention, childhood, midlife, and the elderly. Let me begin to address the cardiovascular disease processes in midlife and how imaging may be helpful. Here we have two imaging technologies that we have been working over the last 10 years or so. They are non-invasive. On the right is 2D or 3D ultrasound, which we can look at the early atherosclerotic lesions in both carotid arteries, in the main aorta, and in, the, in both iliofemoral regions. And here on the left, you have calcification of the coronary arteries. So we can address non-invasively six different regions and to look at, as you will see in a moment, the development of early atherosclerotic disease. We have studied altogether about 12,000 people at different ages. Let's begin here, as we said, with midlife. These were individuals apparently normal between age 40 and age 55, over 4,000 individuals of the PESA study in Madrid. When we look at the six regions that I mentioned, it is interesting that in males between age 45 and 49, for example, two thirds had either one of the regions with arterial disease, two or three regions of four, five or six, two thirds at this relatively earlier age. And here's in women at that age, between 45 and 49 years, about half of the women have already early atherosclerotic disease in either one of the regions that I mentioned in two or three or here four, five or six. So this is a universal disease. And this is the first point I want to make about mid age. I have five points to make. Point number two, what happened with this early atherosclerotic disease? It progresses. In fact, it does over a period of three years. In the PESA study, we are following these individuals for 20 years, but this is the first three year follow-up of the lesions that I mentioned to you. Almost half or at least 41% in these individuals, the disease progress, progress either either of one or two or three lesions or of many lesions, but there was progression already at three years of follow-up. So we are talking about a very systemic, diffuse and universal disease at relatively young age that in fact progresses in this case only over about three years of follow-up. And this is the third point and it's fascinating. What about the quality of the lesions? In, five, in about near 1,000 of these individuals, we did MRI of the arterial system to see the fibrotic lesions and PET to see the inflammatory lesions or the position of lipid material in macrophages. And here on the left with MRI, you can see very interestingly that in the carotid region, 53% of the individuals at mid-age already had early plaques and worse or more significant in the iliofemoral region, near 74%. And now if we go to the inflammatory lesions, 15 or 16% in the carotid region, 24% in the iliofemoral region. We are now investigating whether these lesions that are inflammatory lesions are like the fatty streaks seen at autopsy that may lead to the fibrotic lesions as addressed by MRI. Very interesting because we are reproducing what the autopsies have been telling us over many, many years, but in this case, with non-invasive imaging technology. What about the progression of such quality of lesion, fibrotic lesions here in the bottom with MRI? 
or inflammatory lesions on the top? Well, let's look at age. Uh, elderly or, or the movement of age from 40 years to 59 years, you can see that there is progression of disease. Particularly the blue line is actually iliofemoral disease, most, pre most uh, prevalent or more prevalent than carotid disease, for example. And these are fibrotic lesions with MRI. And this is with PET. A similar situation we can see with PET. That is, older is the age, higher is the incidence of these lesions that we call uh, uh, fatty lesions or inflammatory lesions. And here is very fascinating. This is just the Framingham scoring. At this higher is the Framingham scoring. Here we have more fibrotic lesions and here we have more inflammatory lesions. So in fact, the disease is actually very systemic. It's almost universal in people at relatively young age. The disease progresses and we can see that the progression is not only of the fibrotic lesions, but also of the inflammatory lesions. And this leads to the final, the fifth point of uh, what we talk cardiovascular disease at mid uh, age, uh, and that is uh, the machine learning. Machine learning, what are we talking about? Here's the question. We have the Framingham study. We have other studies, the score approach to prevention or prediction. But what about machine learning? What have we learned of these 4,000 people at midlife looking non-invasively at the early atherosclerotic plaques? And this was the question. What we learn is not only systolic blood pressure, is not only age, is not only LDL, is much more that actually can be predictable of disease early atherosclerotic disease and its progression. And this is actually what you learn by machine learning. We took more than actually 100 variables, and we found that at least 12 of the variables were implicated from the point of view of prediction of the early lesions, not only of the incidence, but also progression. How this fits with the data from the SCORE European approach, the ASCVD, AHA, uh, American College of Cardiology prediction, the Framingham prediction at 10 years and at 30 years. How this compares the machine learning? Well, here's the colors. This means no atherosclerotic disease. In red means mild, moderate, or significant burden of disease. Well, you can see that the best predict predictor of early lesions was actually the Framingham at 30 years of follow-up. But how we can predict, or what is the comparison of such prediction of disease, of risk, when you compare this with the machine learning? Fascinating. With machine learning, the prediction was much more significant than with the conventional approaches. It is true that we are predicting his early disease, where here what they predicted are events. We don't have events yet at that early age. And his progression, much better machine learning than actually the conventional score systems that we use. So here is the first conclusion of about cardiovascular disease in midlife. First, atherosclerotic disease is systemic disease. Second, young age is the way to go, is the best uh, educational strategy to be applied earlier and earlier in life. The disease starts very early. So, third, non-invasive imaging is a role or is going to play a role for future identification of atherosclerotic plaques and their progression, and we have shown this. And finally, machine learning can play a role for future prediction also. So here are the four conclusions from the, from the first five points that I made on the PESA study in 4,000 people midlife, a study that we have carried in Madrid, people that we are following now for a period of 20 years. Now, what about the elderly? Here what we are interested is cerebrovascular disease. And the data I'm going to be presenting to you today, I hope 
it fascinates you because most of the data has been obtained in the last year or two. This is, let's go back about 10 years ago. When we were doing a study, non-invasive study in the elderly population, average age 71 years, this is the so-called bioimage study, that we study 6,000 individuals without previous cardiovascular disease in the area of Chicago and Florida, we found that in a number of them, when we look at MRI of the brain, interestingly, we found like a relationship between disease in the large arteries and these lacuna lesions in the white matter of the brain. We didn't have any idea 10 years ago what it meant, but certainly a very interesting correlation that should be followed from a research point of view. Well, what has happened in the last 10 years has been absolutely important. And I just like to tell you what has been evolving, the hypothesis that has been evolving over the investigation of many groups in many parts of the world, including ours. And this is the hypothesis that we developed two years ago based on all the data available. And this is the following. Risk factors affect large vessel disease, of course. Risk factors and large vessel disease may also affect microvascular disease of the brain. Basically, the risk factors cause this and the large vessel disease is not more than a marker than the risk factors are affecting the large vessels and also the microvascular uh, aspects of the brain. Well, if this is the case, microvascular disease of the brain perhaps affects metabolism of the parenchyma of the brain, particularly of the neurons and of the structure, hypometabolism in affecting the structure of the brain. And this may lead to cognitive dysfunction. And finally, we will talk about Alzheimer's which can also be part of this pathway, at least in part. Very fascinating. We begin with these factors that we are all concerned with heart attacks and strokes, but we are ending up with cognitive dysfunction of the brain. Is this correct? Well, we have been addressing this in the last two years, and I'm going to present to you what for us at least is fascinating information. Let me tell you what are we doing. This is a TANS-NIP study. It's a, it's a study carried out here in New York and in Madrid. And basically, the original hypothesis is the following. 500 individuals, half of them, 250, they begin having neurocognitive uh, impairment, impediment or cognitive impairment. And these are going to be correlated with people with normal cognitive function. 250, so altogether 500 individuals. What we are going to do, looking at the brain with PET for amyloid and with MRI with functional flow through the microvasculature. And we are going to look at the risk factor profile of the large arteries calcification. And here is ultrasound of the carotids and of the iliofemoral system. So we start with the brain but we go to the brain with imaging and we go to the general circulation in the large arteries. And here's pathway two, 500 people, 250, they begin by having a problem in the large arteries, particularly coronary artery calcification or carotid plaques. What do we do? From here, uh, uh, again, we move into the assessment, in this case is green, this is large vessel and risk factors, risk factors here, and large vessel disease, see quantifying this. We started by some abnormality, of course, and then we will go to the brain, PET, neurocognitive testing, uh, microvascular flow. In other words, it's like a crossover study, but there are different groups, 500 people here, 250 with disease is stuck, is starting in the brain and 250 as control. And here 500 people, 250 begin with large vessel disease. And then, and, and we go into the brain to see what the relationship is. And then 250 serving as controls. And now 
I'm going to start presenting to you the information following the hypothesis that we presented at the very beginning. First of all, it is true that risk factors may affect the large vessels. Please, you already know that. Risk factor profile affecting coronary arteries and the rest of the arterial system. And the best data that we have, we already presented it. We looked at, for example, at the Framingham score, as I mentioned before, in 1,000 people, and higher was the score, higher was actually the incidence and progression of fibrotic lesions by MRI. And here is inflammatory lesions with lipid deposition. Higher was the Framingham risk factor profile. Higher was the effect in the large arteries. In this case, again, the carotid arteries being predominant over the iliofemoral arteries. So we proved this. Second, what is the relationship between large vessel disease as a marker of risk factors, for example, and microvascular disease in the brain measured by flow of the microvascular entity of the vascular of the microvascular region of the brain. And this is what we have done with arterial spin labeling MRI that can measure cerebral blood flow. And we look here at carotid plaque volume in relation with cerebral blood flow. Indirectly, we are measuring risk factors, which is, are the risk factors that lead to carotid plaque volume. We use a covariates like age and sex and actually cognitive function, but this is the bottom line. We found a very interesting relationship between carotid plaque volume. that is non-obstructive. It's just a marker of risk factors, a good relationship with actually cerebral blood flow impediment. In, in yellow is impediment of cerebral blood flow, and in red is a little bit of impediment. And that is fascinating information, and that is large vessel disease and indirectly risk factors are affecting the flow of blood to the brain. And we believe this is because of hyperplasia and there is information at autopsy of the microvascular region. So risk factors may affect the microvascular of the brain. And this is what is here. And now go, what about microvascular disease of the brain? Can this lead to neuronal problem, metabolism being less? Or what about the structural aspects of the brain? And this is what we look at. Here, we look at coronary, uh, we look at cerebral blood flow. This was indirectly looked at. And it was, uh, it was addressed by looking at risk factors and subclinical carotid plaque burden that we know affected flow. And we look at metabolism of the brain. And it's fascinating. Here you have, you increase Framingham, you decrease the flow. In fact, you decrease the flow to the brain. And most importantly, in this case, the metabolism of the brain. This is in yellow. This is decreased metabolism by FDG uptake in 66 individuals and getting significant. And this is when there is not only framing up, but more and more hypertension, more effect in terms of a hypometabolism of the brain. And here is actually carotid plaque burden. Again, indirectly, we are looking at risk factors and we are looking at flow to the brain as we showed before. And that is again, very significant. So, there are some gaps here, but we can tell that indeed that the effect of risk factors in large vessel disease may affect the microvascular flow in the brain and hypometabolism, but also structure. Here is actually the structure of the brain. Higher was the Framingham risk score. Decrease was the white matter integrity by MRDTI, which can measure. So not only risk factors in large vessel disease affect the circulation of the brain leading to hypometabolism, but also importantly, the structure of the brain of the white matter is affected. And this actually leads to the following aspects. Is the brain metabolism being affected in the way we presented, starting with risk factors in large vessel disease can this lead or mean cognitive dysfunction? 
and it does. Here we measure cerebral hypoperfusion of the brain by the methods that I mentioned to you before, which is arterial uh, spiral uh, MRI. And we measure actually MOCA. What is MOCA? Cognitive dysfunction. In yellow is more cognitive dysfunction that we see related to age, carotid disease, but this is very, very important. Here, a direct relationship with cerebral hypoperfusion. We measure cerebral hypoperfusion. It was a relationship actually with cognitive dysfunction. And we already showed you before that such cerebral hypoperfusion measured by risk factors in large vessel disease actually affected the microcirculation and hypometabolism of the brain. Here is cognitive dysfunction. Here is the structure of the brain being also affected by the, uh, the perfusion deficits that we mentioned when there is a high risk factor profile. But most importantly, a decrease of the white matter integrity was related also to lower MOCA, MOCA being cognitive dysfunction. In fact, there is a scoring. Normal MOCA is 26 points. 85 to 25 is mild cognitive impairment, 10 to 17 moderate, and less than 10 severe. And what we found is that hyperperfusion, risk factors, may affect metabolism of the brain and may affect the structure of the brain, the volume, but at the same time affecting the MOCA, which is cognitive dysfunction. And this is no more than what we found is that if the brain structure that we talk is about volume of the brain, this is very impressive. And that is with hyperperfusion of the brain in patients with high risk factor profile, we can see that actually the volume of the brain is related to MOCA. And that is less volume when there is hyperperfusion in, uh, in a structural abnormalities of the white matter, we see actually uh, a decrease in MOCA and that is a significant dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction, and this is normal dysfunction, or this is normal function, as we can see, a high MOCA with a normal volume. What we have said thus far is that risk factors may affect large vessels. Risk factors may affect the flow of the microcirculation of the brain, probably intimal hyperplasia, instead of large vessel disease, is microvascular disease. Microvascular disease may affect the metabolism of the neurons of the brain, decrease metabolism by uptake of PET, and also the structure of the brain. Of the brain. But when we have metabolism, this hypometabolism and structural changes, we see cognitive dysfunction. What about Alzheimer's? And here is very fascinating about Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, the neurons may be affected, and this may lead to cognitive dysfunction. But as we'll show now, the microvascular disease of the brain related to what we discuss may also contribute to Alzheimer's, and finally, a thrombotic phenomena. This is just to mention that we have, for example, higher risk factor profile, conventional risk factors as we have talked about, there is an increase in amyloid PET accumulation in Alzheimer's disease is actually favored. And that is the risk factors conventional of Framingham may affect the amyloid deposition of the brain, as you can see. So Alzheimer's disease may be a disease of the neurons, but it may be enhanced by hypoperfusion of the brain with risk factors. And there is more to say we have a mouse model of Alzheimer's. And what we have seen is that the beta amyloid that is entering into the cells, into the cells of the brain, when they are, this beta amyloid circulates in blood can cause blood clots, which affect the perfusion of the brain. And the use of the bigotan and antithrombin may decrease the progression to Alzheimer's in this mouse model, which is leading us to now begin to develop clinical trials of antithrombotic therapy in patients with Alzheimer's. And this is actually a summary of what we have been presenting to you. And that is risk factors 
may affect large vessel disease, but they lead to hypoperfusion of the brain. And this leads to hypometabolism of the brain and atrophy, volume, and structural damage. And this leads to cognitive dysfunction. But even in Alzheimer's, we can start with, this, with disease of the cells of the brain. And in Alzheimer's disease, very complex situation, and you have it here. But at the same time, cerebral hypoperfusion and actually end thrombosis can both affect the actually the perfusion of the brain in contributing to Alzheimer's. So in fact, what we are really said is cerebrovascular disease and cognitive dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease are very close to what we all know, risk factors that affect the large arteries. And I just finished by saying to you that what we should do is to move to childhood and really try to alter and to modify risk factors or to promote health. And this is basically very interesting. And that is between age three to five, the number of centers in the brain that we have is very small number. So whatever you tell a child at that age, it lasts forever, very easy. It just gets there stabilized. Later on is more chaotic, more centers are in the brain and whatever you tell in uh, during, for example, during the puberty, you will start talking to, the, to these uh, children about anything is very confusing because there are many centers of the brain that capture a number of uh, variables that we put into the brain. So the concept is if you teach children at this very early age that health is a priority, this might come up when they are older because it's very well established and recorded. And actually, you know very well that our behavior as adults have a lot to do with what we learn in actually childhood and the environment that we have in childhood. So just to say to you that we have now six projects, and this is all published, in which we have entered into children at different ages, between three and five, six and eight, and nine to 14. And what we teach is in these children how the body works, healthy food habits, physical activity, and then to be prepared to say no, emotional stability, to say no when they are confronted with tobacco, when they are confronted with drugs, alcohol, and so forth. And what we have seen, the best results, and when you do this between age three to five, and you have here all the publications, we are now working with 50,000 children and with different ages to see what is the best way to alter behavior that can actually can have its repercussions, positive benefit when they get older. So all these children that we, st we start at age three to five and all our studies that are randomized are being followed until age 20. And the results are very fascinating, but no time to present them. And this is actually the summary of what I tried to convey this morning. And that is the potential benefit for health is better and better when we start education at earlier stages in life. And in fact, the cost is minimal. Where if we go later, age 50, age 75, the cost of this type of education is very high and actually probably too late. And actually, and, and the potential benefit is much less a very, very important message. So I finish by giving thanks to Dr. Samin Sharma for, for the opportunity to be presenting this in this important meeting. And I try to say the following, that these ages are very different. Here, what we can accomplish with imaging from the research point of view at this time is tremendous, which may lead to all of us move more and more into education at the, in terms of childhood or as early as possible. We talk about cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. The role of imaging is all integrated, but also of all the others. Thank you again for your attention.